to speak or to talk. And so I'd kind of like to get a group conscious and whether you'd like to have them kind of forget about the clock and uh, run a little bit over. <laughs> Okay, now introducing to you from Los Angeles, California, Bob E., our AA speaker. Hi, Bob Earl. I'm a drug addict and an alcoholic. And this talk may be shorter than an hour. It's highly possible I have consumed far too much water while sitting <laughs> <sighs> Pet tables are embarrassing, you know. I mean, you can't just slide out, you know. You cannot slide out. And I spent my whole life trying to slide out, you know. I just never want to maintain a low profile. That's the name of my disease, you know. I, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm really glad that I was asked to come share. I hate this fucking coat. <laughs> <laughs> You can edit the tape if you want, some people. <laughs> that stuff makes some people nervous. It personally doesn't bother me at all. I always hear, I love to hear all the comments about language back and forth in alcohol, in Alcoholics Anonymous. You realize this is where we're talking about language. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I don't know, over the years for me in the program, I've come to learn one thing and I really firmly believe it from the bottom of my heart. As long as somebody is trying to communicate to me from their heart, my soul does not care what words they choose to use. Doesn't care. <laughs> the only thing that cares about the words that people choose to use when expressing themselves in Alcoholics Anonymous is my head. <laughs> I will probably spend a portion of this hour talking about my head. <laughs> I have found in sobriety it is the only enemy I have. <laughs> Thinking has proved to cause me more pain in the 17 years I've been clean and sober than all of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous put together who I did not like when I got here. <laughs> and it's amazing too, you know, because for a long time, I mean, now people talk a little more about recovery and they talk a little more about sobriety. And you get some more speakers today that, that, you know, and they'll say, yeah, I drank and used, okay, now enough of that crap. Now let's talk about what's happening here and now, which is recovery. And I'm of that school. I, I don't, you know, there's, we all need to hear different things from the podium. But I personally, personally, when a man with 20 years of sobriety gets to a podium and he takes 55 minutes to tell me what he used to be like and five minutes to tell me about what it's like now in recovery, I get uncomfortable. See? That bothers me, you know. I want to hear about the 20 years of recovery. We all know we don't know how to drink or use. Okay? That's out front. We wouldn't be here. If you knew how, if I knew how, if it worked, if it continued to do for you what it did for you before you got here, you wouldn't be here. All right. Now we can set that one aside and now we can talk about recovery because recovery is where I have found the pain. Recovery is where I've had to discover who I am. I have never, ever, one time contemplated taking my life until I got sober. <laughs> <laughs> Yours, I contemplated on taking my life. I knew who the problems were and where they lived. You know, that was never an issue. <laughs> it's sober that I think about driving into concrete abutments at 80 miles an hour on the freeway, you know. Ah, oh, well, fuck it, I can't do it one more day, you know. <laughs> and the sad thing, after years of recovery of doing all of that and listening, is I realize it's only my own little voices telling me that. You know, and one of the things that I have discovered in sobriety is that I am the last person who should interpret what's going on in my life. All right. I am far better off to leave it to you to interpret it than I am me because I always interpret it wrong. See? Things that make sense to me are bad for me. 
I like them. I figure it out, say, that's good, I like that, I'll go get that. You know, I mean, I don't know about any of you guys, but I always, you know, sort of get a, uh, a schematic in my mind of what she should be like. <laughs> you know? How tall, what, you know, the education, the money, the tra you know, how well traveled, da 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 I go out and find it and then wonder why am I dying, you know? Because I, I thought this one up and it should be perfect. Why am I so miserable? I knew this is the kind of career I should have, and I'm in it. Why am I dying? You know, it's like all these intellectual logic, all this intellectual reason I have applied to my life and sobriety. And the beauty of that is I forget where I am. I forget that I crawled into the program of Alcoholic Synonymous. I heard some lady say the other night that she saw her father dying. I mean, my old man died from alcoholism, okay, you know. Man, that didn't get me here. What got me here was when I saw me die. You know, I looked in a window one day and I was 26 years old and 130 pounds, man, and my pants were wet and I'd been living outdoors for three months sleeping on rooftops. I was the one that was dying. And I crawled into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, certified mentally ill, and began to think. <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's like it seems part of my disease is to pretend that I don't have a disease. You know? Part of my disease is to go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, which are nothing more than an extension of the day room of any mental hospital anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and pretend I don't belong. Yeah. Geez, I'm okay. Sir, sure, sorry, you feel so bad, you know. I've been in bed for three days in tears, but it's nothing serious, you know. <laughs> Small nervous breakdown, it'll pass. I'll tell you about it when it's over, you see. <laughs> I, learned that, I learned that that's the kind of program my head preferred to work. My head wanted to go ahead, get into the crisis, die, get crazy, cry, crawl through the house, read the books, snivel, you know, just go through all that. And then uh, I came out the other side, then go to the meeting and say, listen, I want to tell you what was going on last month. You know, right? <laughs> I have found the honesty in alcoholics and honesty that somebody just walks up to the podium and goes, oh my God, I can't fucking my God. <laughs> Makes people very uncomfortable. <laughs> Makes me uncomfortable because either I've just been there <laughs> or it's coming on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I never like to look at anything unpleasant about myself. You know? I just discovered recently that I, that, and this is going to sound like insanity, okay? Well, it is, but which is probably why it will sound like insanity. But after, you know, working this program to one degree or another for 17 years, you think you'd learn something or a few things, which I'm sure I have, but I just learned two, a lot two weeks ago that I can't stand criticism. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it well at all. <clears throat> Remarkable. Anyway, I find that my mind, for me, is my enemy because it seems to be burdened with negativity. Yeah, it's never happy. It's never content. I heard somebody say it one time, and I really love it, that the alcoholic is a chronic malcontent. You know, now I don't know about you, but I am. I'm, my mind is chronically malcontent. I am never tall enough. I'm never handsome enough. My clothes are never good enough. The car is never expensive enough. I never earn enough money. I am never intelligent enough. My girlfriend is never pretty enough. She doesn't love me enough. My boss doesn't understand me enough. The house isn't big enough. The sunshine isn't bright enough. The fucking meeting is too small. It's not large enough. You know. <laughs> and then we come in here and people say, hey, go on out there and have a good time. Enjoy life, right? <laughs> Certainly. You tell me how when nothing is ever enough. You know, it's like... And it's like, and I used to listen to this thing, you know, have you ever noticed that your mind, my mind is selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, petty, self-obsessed, sick, <laughs> 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 
and self-gratifying. Now, the dangerous thing for me, see, all the rest of those are minor, because thank God the people in Alcoholics Anonymous who really love me will challenge me immediately on my self-obsession or on my pettiness or on my self-seeking or on my selfishness or on any of those things. They see me get into it and they will challenge me on it immediately, immediately. But the one thing they can't deal with is the self-gratification, okay? You see, my mind needs no one to entertain it. <laughs> Perfectly happy to sit home alone and think. <laughs> Doesn't need a meeting. It will work out the problem I don't. Okay? In 43 years of living, it has never successfully worked out a problem by itself. All right? True. True. Maybe you have, okay? Maybe there's some of you in this room who are well-adjusted, rational, mature adults. Okay? Probably the Alateens. <laughs> I unfortunately am not. And it's impossible to make logical, rational, adult, mature decisions in one's life if one is not one. Okay? It seems that we have got to get a little assistance. Assistance. And isn't it interesting that the last thing my mind wants, my, I'm talking about yours, just mine, is assistance. It has never, ever, at any time since I can remember, asked for help, doesn't want help, resents help, would appreciate it if you would mind your own goddamn business, <laughs> it would rather die quietly. I am thoroughly convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that my head, honest to God, believes that it can kill me and go on. <laughs> moving the water out of my reach before I really get in trouble here. <laughs> and my head would like to really set me up for that one. Anyway, that more water, what the hell, you're strong, right? You know. <laughs> well, my head's always doing that crap to me. It, it'll put anything on me that I can't do so it can then tell me how worthless I am. Okay? It's all forever putting me into absolutely impossible killing situations and then saying, see, Flake? <laughs> you, I told you you were worthless. Right? The thing that began to help me recover from all this madness and Alcoholics Anonymous is one day I realized my head was saying a very interesting thing. It kept saying, why don't we stay home? Why don't we call her? Why don't we do this? Why don't we quit our job? And I thought, who the hell is it talking to? <laughs> you know, I mean, here I am, home alone, by myself in an apartment, and it's saying we. You know, no dog, no cat, no bird, no animal, nothing breathing in the pad but me, okay? And it's saying we. We. And I began to think, aha, there must be another part of me that it's trying to convince. That's the only reason, you see, because if my mind, of and by itself, was the only power in my life, it wouldn't have to talk to me. I would be like an automaton or a robot. There would be no need for this sucker to speak to me, okay? But there's another part. There is a soul. There is that part of me that can be spiritually guided. It is that part of me that allowed me, filled with hate and hostility, willing to kill you, to sit in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and listen to a speaker first time. What in my head? My head didn't want to go to the meeting. My head had nine million reasons for not going to the meeting. But another part of me went to the meeting. Okay? And another part of me stuck the hand up and said, yeah, God, man, are we ever one, you know. We will stay here for a while. And the head never wanted to stay. Never liked Alcoholics Anonymous. Thought most of what was being said from the podiums was bullshit. You know, hated the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Detested people in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I was 26 years of age, skinny, angry, and I got clean and sober in Pasadena, and that was not a winning combination. <laughs> God apparently thought it was, because I'm still here. I'm here because people looked past my mind to that other part of me. I'm here because people had enough love. There was one lady in Alcoholics Anonymous, Helen, who, God, I love her, because when I got here, man, my mouth was so bad. I mean, bad. If it had less than or more than four letters, I did not use it. You know, <laughs> because I just felt I couldn't really get my point across clearly and concisely and succinctly with more than four letters. You know. <laughs> and after every meeting, this marvelous, beautiful, just, God, just an angelic older lady would come up to me and stand there with spiritual eyes and ask me how I was and I would tell her <laughs> you know just insane you know just mad right fire coming out of my eyes and she'd smile and just you know be really polite and sweet and bless me and wish me well and go on her way and the next night we would go to the same routine and I would smile and she kept coming, and I started thinking the old bride has got, you know, got a thing for young guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> the dirty words turn her on, you know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> My head will say anything it can to separate me from you if you can help me. My head will tell me anything it can about you to get you out of my life so that you can't help me. Think about that next time you're sitting around cutting someone up between your ears. Mm -hmm. yeah? It may just be the one person who can do the most for you. And your head is just bam, dropping that steel curtain. Years later, I ran into her. We went to a convention together in Hawaii. And I had to know. <laughs> I couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> Because about 12 years have gone by now or so, and finally I said, Helen, God, you've got to tell me. You must tell me. How? How could you possibly stand there and be kind and sweet and loving and gentle and listen to the hostility and the anger and the hatred and the vulgarity that poured out of my mouth? And she just smiled very sweetly, and she took my hand, and she said, It's simple. She said, I looked past what you were saying to what you are. I said, See, when I had no idea what I was, when I had no idea there was another part of me, when you could have, you could have painted signs on my house saying, there's more to you than your mind, quit listening, I wouldn't care. I thought that's all there was. I thought all I was was my past, which wasn't pretty and what was going on between here, which also wasn't pretty, which didn't make me much of a person, not much of a person. And I mean two things. People don't love somebody that's not much of a person, and God doesn't help anybody who's not much of a person. My head used to just tell me, let's get back to the, the two things first. I never know. We're going to here. We're going to go. <laughs> More of the children have just showed up now. They all want to talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're saying, okay, fuck him, we're going to get equal time, right? <laughs> He's talking all this weakness in God, we're going to get here and talk strength, <laughs> courage. He's got to make this program, that's what my head would like me to believe, right? You know, I mean, I love that one. I always love to hear people in AA talk about strength. <laughs> You've got to be kidding, Jesus. Oh got a problem, son, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You want potatoes, get a hole. <laughs> Turn it over to God and do the footwork. We unfortunately don't have a map for you. Lots of luck, but do the footwork anyway. You know. I love it. I mean, maybe some people forget where the hell we came from. You know, I know my head would like to forget where I came from, but love to forget. It does not want me to openly and publicly admit I'm chicken shit. <laughs> Weak, inadequate, frightened, scared to death, and need you desperately. Need you desperately. Without you, there is no me, okay? My head doesn't even want to hear that, because it doesn't like you. Because if I deal on the other level, 
if I deal on a spiritual level, if I deal on a feeling level rather than a thinking level, rather than an intellectual level, you have more power than my head. See? The living proof of that is the fact that I am clean and sober 17 years. Okay? Because I am Looney Tunes upstairs. Okay? <laughs> it's toys in the attic, man. Don't think up. <laughs> Some of which are broken and did not mend properly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I've had to learn that because my head thinks something doesn't make it so. I heard it just the other morning. The guy was beautiful, man. He said, 92% of the things we fear never come to pass. And I went, man, the sucker's right. You know, I spend all my life sitting around worrying about next week, next month, you know. I wake up in the morning worried. My head loves the morning. God, <laughs> I mean, it is always there in the morning. I describe it this way because I know of no other way. It's like a vulture sitting on the headboard looking down, right? <laughs> And you open one eye and it says, Ah, oh, I'm glad you're awake, huh? <laughs> I want to talk to you. <laughs> you ever get this feeling of wait, lay awake all night? <laughs> While the body slept, it just lurked in the shadows waiting for you to wake up, right? And you wake up, if your mind is like mine, the first thing mine always says to me is, you're tired, you didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah. I may have had 14 hours, I may have had four, it doesn't matter, it says the same thing. Yeah. Well, you can't go to work today, I'm as tired as you are. <laughs> then it says, well, but you better go to work, but if you don't go to work, you'll probably lose your job. <laughs> And if you go to work as tired as you are, you're going to screw up and you're going to lose your job anyway. <laughs> but now you've got one eye open, you're unemployed. <laughs> yeah. Then it says, now that you've lost your job, <laughs> you haven't even got out of bed, you don't know nothing, right? But it does. Yeah. It knows, man, it knows. Ask it, it'll tell you, you know. <clears throat> They'll say, now you lost your job and you only got $413 in the bank, sucker, you're in big trouble. <laughs> okay? I mean, you're not going to last out the month. <laughs> By now, if you have any kind of program at all, you're desperately trying to get into the nightstand to get the daily word of the 24-hour day book or something, anything other than what's going on here, you know. In the beginning, unfortunately, you probably just lay awake and listen to this sucker tell you how bleak it is, right? And then if your mind is like mine, the next thing it will do is it will start running a medical scan of your body, right? <laughs> Look for sore spots, right? You know. Uh, It'll always find one and say, uh oh. <laughs> you know what that is, don't you, dummy? That's a big C. <laughs> You're gonna die, how are you gonna handle that? <laughs> You're going to stay sober, go to meetings and talk about it, or you're going to be sick and shit and drink and hide out. <laughs> and then they wonder why the sober alcoholic doesn't weep up to greet the day. Okay? You're unemployed, broke, and dying. <laughs> I heard an old tyrant one time really describe our insanity marvelous. He said, you know, he said it's like, you take the average guy who walks into the company in the morning, secretary says to him, John, boss wants to see you. John walks on in, wraps on the boss's door, goes in, sits down, finds out what the hell he has to say, splits and goes in and takes care of it. You take one of us, an alcoholic like me, I walk in in the morning, secretary says, Bob, boss wants to see you. First thing I'm going to do, man, I'm going to go in the men's room, I'm going to lock myself in the stall and sit down and figure out what he wants to see me about. <laughs> Once I figure out what he wants to see you about, I figure out what I'm going to say to him, what I'm going to say to him, and why. 
Then I go into his office and I find out, of course, that's not at all what he wanted to see me about. So when we get all done, I go back to the John, lock myself in the stall again, think all the things I should have said to him. <laughs> Which shows that we can get a lot more out of a simple situation than the average person. <laughs> I mean, why feel good? You know, why have a good time? Why the hell should we enjoy life when we can be busy thinking? <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine says, life is what's happening while you're busy making plans. <laughs> I have found that mental illness is only compatible with sobriety and having a good time if you have a sense of humor. The first person I had to learn not to take seriously was me, and boy, that's a bitch. That's really hard. See, we've been listening to ourselves all of our lives. In fact, I'm the only one, for the most part, I've listened to all my life. I mean, I have assumed that it was because of information you gave me, but that's really not true. It's not because of information you gave me. It's because of my interpretation of the information that you gave me. The best things that have happened to me in sobriety have come to me out of what appeared to be the worst tragedies of my sobriety, without exception. Okay? I mean, it's like, um, that's like I could carve that in granite. See, because my head is always busy interpreting. I read a great thing in a little book once, and it really sums it up. It's, it's, it's judging, it's that need to judge, that need to figure out, that need to intellectualize, that need to decide that losing your job when you had nothing to do with the fact that you lost your job is bad. See, we're conditioned to that crap. It's not true. Who the hell cares to lose your job? I believe in a God who loves me enough that if this door is closing, man, the next one's made of gold. Okay? Did not always, however, in early sobriety, believe in that God. <laughs> was a little nervous, was a little concerned about God when I first got sober. People said, turn it over. <laughs> you know, just let God come into your life. I thought, certainly, right. See, I knew that the dumbest thing I could do, man, would be stand out in the open somewhere and say, thy will be done. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I knew what his will was for me. <laughs> Didn't want any part of it, you know. My head told me that if I was lucky, if God loved me just a little bit, the best I would get would be 20 years sober washing dishes in a men's 12th step house, celibate talking about gratitude. <laughs> it never told me I could have a good time here. It never told me I could make a lot of money in sobriety. It never told me I could be respected at what I do in sobriety. It would reach into my path and it would pull out all the negatives and tell me how bleak it was going to be. It would say, well, you don't have an education. They threw you out of high school in the 10th grade. You don't have a trade. You were in every apprenticeship program in the construction industry and flunked out of all of them. Okay? Don't have a profession. Don't have a trade. Don't have an education. There's not much hope, man. You know, people try to get me to go out and sell things, right? <laughs> I remember when that one happened. You know, I gave an AA talk one night. A guy came up. I was sober by now a couple of years. It's totally insane. And somebody came up and said, God, with that much enthusiasm, you ought to be a salesman. I said, gee, it's a good idea, right? You know. Boy, whenever it's a good idea anymore, I just dust the hell out of the way. Of it. <laughs> My life makes no sense to me at all today. None of it. And I have never been happier. Never had more love, more beauty, more peace, more hope, and more thrills in my life than I do today, and I don't understand any of it. Uh, thank God. It isn't necessary that you understand. So let me rephrase that. It's not necessary that I understand. If I tell you, if I tell you it's not necessary that you understand, your head will immediately throw a little ball. <laughs> so it's necessary for us to understand. Maybe not him, but we've got to. Don't <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen to him. He's still drinking water. We're trying to. <laughs> And we know he's had too much. <laughs> he admitted it. He can't keep his hands off the glass. And I think obsessive compulsive behavior leaves with the grave. <laughs> God. 
Anyhow, I read this marvelous thing about judgment, see, because I had no hope. I mean, I came from a background. I mean, I'm one of these people who lived in the streets. I ran in the streets. I ripped and run. I ripped and run in the streets. I'm the kind of person that always took down both ends of those deals, which makes for a lot of enemies and a lot of firepower and a lot of people get hurt. Okay, that's what I came. That's what you're on. So I knew there was not going to be a God or love for me because you can't hurt people like I hurt people and come in here and have anybody or anything or particularly this God, whoever, whatever it was, care about you. So there was no hope for me because my head always interpreted everything. It said, because you don't have an education, you'll never amount to anything. Because you don't have a trade, you'll never amount to anything. Because you're divorced, you'll never amount to anything. Because, 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 you will never amount to anything. It always was interpreting, and that happened to you, and that's bad, and this is happening to you now, and this is bad. And this is happening, and this is bad. This marvelous story was about a little old guy who lived outside the village, somewhere in Europe, and he had a son and a white horse, a magnificent white horse. And this white horse was just desired by kings because it was so beautiful. And they would come and they were offering large sums of money and saying, let us buy your white horse. And the old man would say, no, I'm sorry. The white horse is not for sale. The horse is my friend. I cannot sell him. And the villagers would come to him and say, you're stupid old man. You should sell the horse. Take the money and buy a bigger ranch and move to the city and live like royalty. The old man said, no, I cannot sell my horse. One morning the old man woke up and the horse was gone. He ran away. And the villagers all come running out to the farm and they said to the little old man, You see, we told you, you should have sold your horse. What a terrible thing has happened. He has run away and now you have nothing. And the old man looked at him and said, I don't know that a terrible thing has happened. All I know is that he's not here this morning. And the villagers went away shaking their heads. About a week later, the white horse returned, and he brought back six others with him from the mountains. And the villagers ran out to his ranch, and they said, You were right, old man. You were right all along. It wasn't bad that your white horse ran away. It was good, because he brought back more horses, and now you can train these horses and sell them. And the old man said, I don't know if that is good or not. All I know is he was gone, and he is back, and he has brought more horses with him. And his young son began to help him. As about, you know, a boy about 16, 17, 18 years of age. He began to help him break the horses. These six horses that had come back with the big white horse. And the boy was thrown off one of the horses and broke both of his legs. And once again, the villagers ran out to his ranch. And they said to him, you were right again, old man. And you were always right. It was not a good thing that the horse brought the six other horses back. Because now your only son has both his legs broken and he could be of no value to you. It is a tragedy. The old man said, I don't know that it's a tragedy. He said, all I know is that the horse ran away and he came home with other horses. And now my son's legs are broken. I don't know that it's a tragedy. And about two weeks later, the small country in which they lived went to war. It's a much larger nation. And the soldiers came to the, to the countryside, gathering all able-bodied young men out of the villages to go fight this losing war at the boundary. Every young man who went into this army knew he was going to die. But the old man's son had two broken legs. He couldn't go. And once again, the villagers ran out to his place, and they said to him, You were right, old man. It was not a bad thing. We are going to lose all our sons, and yet you have yours because his legs are broken. And the old man said, I don't know that that's a good thing. He said, I only know that the horse ran away and came back to six more, and my son has had his legs broken. He doesn't have to go to war. He said, The judgments. The judgments. The good, the bad, the right and wrong. The big book of Alcoholics and I says very clearly and very precisely, we must get rid of all of our old ideas, including our ideas of right and wrong. Must get rid of all of them. Boy, that's a bitch, you know? Try it! I mean, my head had me totally convinced the first four years I was sober in this program that the only way to get next to God was to become a good credit application, right? If I could whip my life into good enough shape that I could finally fill out a goddamn credit app without having to go to the space below, okay? <laughs> my whole life was spent going to the space below. A 
I could ever get to that point where I've been on the same job five years, lived in the same residence five years, married to the same woman five years, banked with the same bank five years, I would finally be good enough for God. I believe that. Now you may sit and say, hmm, but I <laughs> believe that I honest to God believe it. And I spent the first four years of my sobriety doing the best job I knew how to do to become a good credit application. I should tell a whole story here. When I was two years sober and still very worried about God, I mean really worried about God, and I couldn't understand God, because everybody kept saying, God, as you understand him, God, as you understand him, God, as you understand him. And the minute you said to me, God, as you understand him, I got this mental picture of the old man, high in the sky, in a throne, with a book, keeping score. <laughs> okay? He knew and I knew we weren't even, and so there was no need for conversation or communication between us. Okay? But every now and then, I'd go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and I'd hear a speaker get up at the podium, and he'd say, God, I got up this morning, and, uh, you know, I mean, I got served with divorce papers, and I lost my job, and uh, my car broke down, and, uh, you know, and it was... Uh, just bleak, and the IRS levied all my money out of my bank account. So I went home and I got on my knees and I said, Dear God, please help me, please help me, please help me. And by nightfall, I had the old lady back, the IRS returned the money, and the car was running, right? <laughs> hey, you hear that, you know, and uh, you're struggling to make ends meet, you say, Okay, I'll go home and pray. I really need this God. You know, I'll try this one out. I got to try this one out, all right? I go home. Overlap the drapes, always. Be cool, right? Can't have anybody look in and catch you on your knees, all right? This <laughs> huh? thing, man. It's what it is. It's the head, right? Oh, God. Jesus. Did you ever notice? I say this because it's a point. Some people don't like it, but it's true. Did you ever notice when people pick up a gun to take their lives, they do not shoot themselves in the foot? <laughs> Trying to shut up the voices, man. Trying to shut up the voices. Thank God we have a program. Thank God my life is filled with people who will listen to my voices. I can talk to my friends with any of the voices I care to, and they just smile and go, hmm, Jesus, you know. <laughs> Bob has another good idea. Watch him go, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, I go home, overlap the drapes, slip into my bedroom, kneel down, bow my head, fold my hands, and my voice would say, forget it. <laughs> God will only work for the good people, and you're not one of the good people. Hang in there and do it as good as you can. So I went to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting one night, and a guy told a story. And what happened out of the story was the first step for me of beginning. Beginning to understand God. Okay, now all I'm telling you is my understanding. You believe anything you want to believe. I know what I say is true for me. Okay. Simple story about two men drinking in a bar in Alaska. One was a very religious man, the other was an atheist. Eventually their conversation swung around to God. The religious man looked at the, the atheist looked at the religious man, he says, I don't believe in your God. The religious man says, Why not? Atheist said, I gave your God a chance to prove himself to me once, and he didn't do it. Religious man says, in what manner did you give God a chance to prove himself? Atheist says, well, about six months ago, I was lost about 150 miles north of town in the blizzard. And I knelt down in the snow, and I looked at the sky, and I said, God, if there is one, I'm lost, and I'm going to die. Religious man smiled, a very knowing smile. He said, why, you must believe you're here. Atheist said, nah, some goddamn Eskimo came along and showed me the way back to town. <laughs> well, see, now my poor head finally lost round one because I was sitting in that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous two years clean and sober and I never called this outfit. I never dropped a dime in the phone and called this outfit, all right? I was sitting in a doorway in Pasadena, dying. I had the phone number at Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had a dime, and I kept them hidden from myself. And I went to a payphone 50 times and dropped the dime in and listened to the dial tone. 
and I hung it up and walked away. You see, because I had never asked anybody for anything ever. And I was not going to call up some people in some funny little office somewhere that I didn't know, man, and say, I can't make it. Now I'll tell you about God and Eskimos because I'm here as a result of Eskimos, you see. One day I'm sitting in my dirty little doorway, man, and I hear this voice say, hey, what the hell's going on with you, man? If you ain't got no place to stay, you can come stay with me and the old lady. And I look up and standing there is this guy I've known for a few years. And when I was ripping and running, I used to go through some Robin Hood phases, all right? And him and his old lady and their six kids have been on welfare ever since I'd known him, okay? And I've laid a lot of money on him. And so I look at him, and he is a perfect Eskimo. He was sent to me by a loving God, you see, by a God that understood my madness. My head, all through my sobriety, tried to keep telling me, fix yourself and God will love you. I should have known that was backwards. God loves me, turn to him, and he will help me fix myself. Okay? You'll die. Please turn tape now. Do not run to in. Thank you. Why do you keep telling me, fix yourself and God will love you? I should have known that was backwards. God loves me, turn to him, and he will help me fix myself. Okay? You'll die trying to get good enough to go to God around the doctor. You'll go start raving mad trying to reach a point of mental illness so that you can deal with the spiritual deity. Yeah? They'll find you chewing on the table leg, man. <laughs> <laughs> I look at this guy standing there and he's a perfect Eskimo for me and I'm going to go stay with him and his old lady for a very simple reason. There's no charity involved. Okay? The son of a bitch owes it to me to take me out of that doorway. It is a code, baby. We are both in the streets and he's into me for a few thousand dollars. It is his goddamn duty to take me out of that doorway. And he did. And he took me home. And that night I was sitting on his couch, skinny and sick, shaken, running down the goddamn apartment building, the one bedroom apartment, wall to wall with cockroaches, him and his old lady and the kids. I said, God, these days, I'm going to have to call that AA thing man, and go do something about what's happening with me. He said, there's a girl down the hall goes to AA, Eskimo number two. I swear to God, I did not know girls went to alcohol. It was 1962, man. 1962, in the places I was, no one went to meetings that were girls. Only people who were old, sick, and crippled, it was part of their program. And if they ever wanted to see the free world again, they'd better drag their ass to an AA meeting. <laughs> All right? I walked down the hall and knocked on the door, and God loves me. See, because God understands my sickness. I don't have to get well for him. He understands. Yeah. Because he knew that if there had been an adorable, lovely little girl standing on the other side of the door, I would have lied. Okay? I would not have been able to help myself. I would have started lying before I even had a chance to think about it. I would have gone into some spiel about how my father was a chronic alcoholic and I heard that she was involved with an organization that dealt with alcoholism and possibly she could pass on to me some information which would be beneficial to me if I could find the son of a bitch I'd help him, you know. <laughs> Standing there 130 pounds with wet pants trying to give this speech, right? Now God loves me too much to kick it open the door after I knocked on it was big enough to break every bone in my body. <laughs> She stood about 6'2", 6'3", she weighed about 235 pounds, she had short black hair, she was built like a full black, she had full black, she had tattoos all the way down both arms and both legs, okay? She was half drunk, she had a half full pint of booze in her hand. This is my introduction, alcoholics now, okay? <laughs> I stand here tonight, 17 years, clean and sober since my first meeting, but don't tell me to be careful when you say you're a newcomer. <laughs> <laughs> I look at this big, tough, brown man, and I could talk to her because she was street people. I looked at her, and I said, hey, I'm curious about this AA hey, thing. She looked me dead in the eyes. God bless her, man. She said, AA hey, will work if you want it, and I am not ready to quit drinking. <laughs> Right, I wouldn't quit either. <laughs> yeah, makes sense to me. 
I knew that I would turn around and go right back out in the streets, man. If I had her size, her stomach, her stamina, her muscles, I'd go. But I didn't. And so I could say to her, hey, you know what? I can't go on. I'm sick and I'm tired and weak and I can't go on. And she felt the responsibility for the sobriety she had had. An Eskimo. There's a slipper. Stuck me in a car. Drunk. And took me to a meeting. Do I talk to me about the power of God? Do I talk to me about getting well enough for God to take care of me? Nah, man. Uh-uh. Not when a slipper sticks you in a car drunk and takes you in a baby. Mm. I heard that story and I said, hey, this is terrific. God works through people. God works through people. Two years clean and sober. It finally dawned on me. You know, the instrument God has in people. And I said, terrific. And I went home to my little apartment. I felt better. If the kingdom is in me, it's in everybody. And people are his instrument. But then my head talked to me. He said to me, yeah, that's true, that's how it works, but there's three areas of your life, son, God wants nothing to do with. I'm like a fool, I said, what are they? I don't ask questions anymore in my mind. <laughs> the only thing I ask my mind anymore is, what is your source of information? Because it doesn't have one. <laughs> Never has. I don't know where it got all this information from. But Jesus is just it's hysterical. So I said, well, where are they? They said, well, the first area God isn't interested in is the girls that you date. I thought, well, okay, yeah, I can buy that, right? You know God and love and sex and I go, yeah, that makes sense. God isn't interested in that area. I, I accept that. I said, what's next? He said, the next area God is interested in is employment. I mean, God doesn't care where you work. I thought about that for a minute. I thought, yeah, okay, that's true. That makes good sense. I don't, I don't care. Uh, God doesn't really care about uh, uh, where uh, I work. Yeah. I said, all right, what's the last area? I said, money. God doesn't care about money. God and money are not synonymous. And I said, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I said, now go ahead and you don't get it, right? Now that you know God works through people. Here's what my mind had just done to me, all right? I had begun to get an understanding of a loving God. And my mind had now said to me that employment, money, and women are the three areas that God is interested in. In the 17 years, I have been clean and sober in a program of Alcoholics Anonymous, man, and I have sponsored a lot of people. I have never, ever in my entire sobriety gotten a phone call in the middle of the night from one of my babies who was crying and dying or putting his fist through all that the cause of his pain wasn't one of three things. Employment, money, or women. Okay? The very three things my mind told me I must now take care of. I did. For the next two years. I went to work and I worked at it hard because I wanted God to love me and I wanted to be a good credit application. And I thought it out and I worked it out and I maneuvered and manipulated and figured and arranged and I did it as good as I knew how to do it. And four years clean and sober approaching my fourth birthday, I went financially bankrupt through the courts. I was handling the money. <laughs> they repossessed my automobile. Again, I was handling the money. I had been uncomfortably and not by desire celibate for a few months, and that was no fun at all, okay? And I was working in a car wash for a dollar and a quarter an hour. I was handling employment. And the bummer about the car wash was I had started in soap at a dollar thirty-five, but I broke out in a rash from the goddamn detergent. <laughs> had to be moved to the drive-off end. So approaching four years of sobriety, I was flat broke, did not own an automobile, had a rash on both arms. My hemorrhoids were coming back from bouncing in and out off the hot car seats all day long. I was horny and not very happy. <laughs> That's as good as I can do it. Okay? That's clean and sober with the 12 steps, right? What is the sign? Steps to what is it? Steps to, steps to the promises. <laughs> okay. I was, I was trying to step to the promises. <laughs> Unfortunately, one more time, I started in the alley. I spent my whole life in alleys. I'm always in the alley, right? Never on the boulevard where it's happening. And my head, my head always says, no, go down 
the alley. You know, we're used to alleys. We're comfortable in alleys. You know, the good people walk on the boulevard. You know, you and I will go down the alley. Jeez, that's a fucking stupid alley. I can't see straight. Anyhow, an Eskimo drove through the car wash and offered me another job. <laughs> After a year on this job, I broke my back. I surrounded. Yeah, well, uh, mm, uh, <coughs> yeah, okay. Hmm? Don't, don't lose my head. My head, my head. We're running out of time here. <laughs> I had, uh, I was approaching my fifth birthday and I'm like, oh, screw it. Uh, <laughs> See, see, I was thoroughly convinced. I kept looking around AA and I became convinced that there was a secret here. Okay? That there was either a, a coded message hidden in the big book or a, another set or a, a, a secret goddamn meeting or a piece of literature that you had to know the right person to get. But there was something going on and I was five years, four years on the program and I couldn't find it. You know? Because people felt better than I did. You know? And they had more peace of mind than I had. And they had less sobriety than I had. I mean, you know, when I was broke on my ass in the car wash, man, I was borrowed three, four hundred dollars from my baby, for Christ's sake. You know, I mean, I was not what you would call an example of successful recovery. Yeah. You know? My babies are coming to pick their sponsor up, take him to the meeting, because he ain't got a car, right? Yeah. You know? But anyhow, I worked on this job as a die catcher for almost a year and I went back to a convention in Denver, Colorado and I was there a week and I had a great time and got ready to leave this damn convention. We, we pulled out, see I believe in Eskimos and the power of God and I'm like, yeah, screw it, I'll slow down and tell this man because I have almost died in sobriety. I have had this immense pain of trying to fix me so that I would be good enough for God instead of letting God take care of me. I'm back in Colorado. We, we leave this, this, this clubhouse there and after the convention and we're in a brand new Dodge and we turn the corner and the tie rod snaps. Brand new Dodge, okay? Guy had taken it to the gas station to have a tire with a bubble that had changed and the Eskimo at the gas station had dropped it off the jack and it had bent the tie rod. The tie rod broke. We pulled over the curb, park, man and his wife pulling right behind us, okay? Eskimo, right? They've been at the convention. The kind of guy hated an alcoholic anonymous, right? I'd gotten clean and sober with 3,000 of them in Pasadena. Charlie Snowshoes, you know? That, never drank that much, you know, never got that bad. One day they passed out in the boardroom in their corporation. It was embarrassing. They came to and got sober. Their lives were in better shape. Drunk than mine was sober, you know. <laughs> Had no communication with them at all. Figured they wouldn't know emotional pain if it ran them down in the middle of the street, you know. <laughs> Drinking was their problem, okay. And I look at this guy. He's about 43 years of age, prematurely gray, lovely wife sitting next to him, their three-year-old baby daughter. And I said, oh, God, Charlie Snowshoes, right? The car is busted. What the hell? You know, I mean, Eskimo is an Eskimo, all right? Can't, can't be too shaking. Yeah. We couldn't get the car fixed that day because it was new and it had to be repaired under warranty. Now, listen very carefully to what this man said to us because it's the basis of spiritual principles. The basis of spiritual principles. One my head hates, absolutely hates. He said, look, okay, you guys can't get your car fixed. We'll take the six of you, those six of us, three guys are go. We'll take you all out to our house, put you up for the night. And we'll pack you lunch tomorrow and put you on the road back to California when your car is repaired. He's taking his brothers and sisters off the street and he's going to house them and feed them. The basis of spiritual principle. Okay? They got the car towed in, took the girl out the house, came back, got us, and get out in the southeast end of the pool in this messy circular drive in front of this big brick house, another new car in the driveway, and an unmoving and Charlie Snowshoes, right? Walk through the house in spiritual frame of mind, press the furniture to the best of my ability. <laughs> It was all terribly expensive, you know, I figured, oh, well, what the hell, right? That night, we're all sitting around this giant oak table in the kitchen, eight of us having coffee, and the man looked at me and said, I was really glad to hear you talk about drugs at the convention. I thought, what in the hell does Charlie Snowshoes in the Denver Colorado want to know about Bill? This is 1967, you know, Jesus Christ. So I looked at him and said, why? And he looked over at his wife and he smiled with a marvelous, gentle, very spiritual smile. He said, well, he said, Mother Ray doesn't like me to talk about this a lot. He said, but I'm a three-time loser for drug addiction from California. Charlie Snowshoes, my first judgments are always good, you know. <laughs> he said, and I went to AA in Quentin, and I went to AA in Fulton. He said, but it didn't take, man. He said, I came to Denver two days over four years ago, and I was two days clean. He said, I walked into the clubhouse in downtown Denver, which is a skid row clubhouse. He said, Mother here is working behind the counter serving food. 
He said, I remember what the people in AA had said about it. If you want what we have, I don't want to go to any lengths to get it. And I wanted what that lady had, and I knew that with her, I would be able to stay clean and stay sober. That doesn't sound like don't get emotionally involved, does it? <laughs> I look at him, man, and my mind starts working like a computer. You know, his jacket is worse than mine, for Christ's sake. I've got more time on the program than he has. I know he ain't got the job, right? He can't have the money. She ain't. She can't have the money because she's working at Skid Row Clubhouse. I now know I have finally found the son of a bitch who's going to tell me what the secret is. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be living the way he's living, man, without stealing or knowing the secret. All right? And I looked at him and I said, okay, I said, look, I said, I know we both belong to the same fellowship and we both try and practice the same 12 principles in our life on a daily basis. I said, well, would you mind explaining all of this to me? <laughs> and he looked at his wife and smiled the same beautiful smile one more time. He said, mother and I go to a lot of meetings and we take the third step every morning. I was almost five years clean and sober. Almost five years clean and sober. Okay. Heavy into AA activity. Okay. I had never said no to an AA request because I was raised that way in AA. I had traveled 40,000 goddamn miles a year in institutions, okay? I had helped newcomers that I hated, okay? Got out of bed when I didn't want to get out of bed. I used to make coffee and think about putting raid in it. I hated it. <laughs> I had done all these things for five years, and for the first time I heard the third step of AA. Mm-hmm. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Period. Doesn't say minus girlfriends, it doesn't say minus employment, it doesn't say minus money, it doesn't say minus anything. It said made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, period. I came back to California and I went back to my little apartment and I went to my job one day and I came home that night and I sat down in my bed and one of the things that had been driving me crazy in Alcoholics Anonymous is I knew that if I could ever find the right prayer, God would understand me. If I could just get to be a good enough human being and I could find the right words with which to pray, then maybe he'd do for me what he was doing for the rest of you in AA. Because you weren't showing me your pain, so I didn't know you were hurting me. And I sat on my bed that night, almost five years sober, in absolute total desperation. I looked at the ceiling in my apartment and I screamed at the top of my lungs. I said, if you're not there, I am fucked. I could change the prayer for those of you who were a symphony, but it would diminish it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I knew if there was no God, I was going to have to die because I'd worked this program as good as I knew how to work it, and I had given it every ounce of energy I knew how to give it, and I had done as good as I could on the job, and I had done as good as I could paying bills, and I had done as good as I could in relationships. I had done it as good as I could do it, and I didn't know how to do it any better. I went to work the next day. I placed a brand new Allen head wrench into a brand new Allen head bolt, slipped. I went backwards against one of the furnaces and crushed two vertebrae in my back. Short time later, I'm laying in the emergency hospital, and the doctor is saying to me, okay, you can't stand for long periods of time. You can't lift anything heavy, because my back has been broken a number of times with my attitude. It was easy to get it broken. Anyway. <laughs> And I'm laying there in the hospital and all the doctors leave me in this little cubicle and they walk out and my head starts screaming. See, you goddamn dummy, you surrendered to God last night and you broke your back. Okay? But I was tired, man. I was tired. I was tired of making judgments. I was tired of interpreting. I was tired of figuring. And another little voice from down in here said, why don't you shut up? I thought, God, I think I will. You know, I'm really tired. I'm really tired. You want to ask me how I tell God's will? It depends on where the voice comes from. It comes from up here, I try and ignore it. If it comes from down here, I listen. I swear to God, I guess the Anyway, I went about doing the things I was supposed to do. I decided it wasn't a bad deal. I filed for vocational rehabilitation, disability insurance, etc., etc., etc. I had to go through all the bureaucratic bullshit of civil service and all the rest of that crap. Gets you nuts when you're already nuts, right? They gave me an aptitude test five times. I came out five different things, okay? You know. <laughs> They didn't know what to do with me. I didn't know what to do with you, you know. I came out of Forest Ranger, a classical pianist, a social worker, a psychologist, and something else. And I kept trying to tell this chick that was my counselor, I said, if you put the pianist in the forest, we got a problem, right? <laughs> Finally, I got an idea. I don't know where it came from. I went in and I said to her, I said, hey, you know what? I said, I'd like to try and be a writer. This was in December. This was six months after I broke my back. And I she almost fell out of a wheelchair laughing. She thought that was so funny, okay? Because I don't have an education. I have failed English ever since the fourth grade, and I'm a phonetic speller. I mean, she knew. She'd seen my paperwork. She knew everything there was about me. She thought it was hysterical. 
they were so goddamn glad to get me off their caseload and paid for a correspondence course. Okay? First thing I submitted to a studio, they bought. They bought. Came as a result of breaking my back. Okay? It's 12 years later. I still write for a living. I'm very successful in what I do. I'm respected in what I do. I work for one of the hottest organizations in the industry. And they ask me questions. And when I have a big project, they come and we sit down and we talk about it. And I'm amazed. The only other thing I had to learn is about love and about relationships and about caring, about you and personally and in my private life. Because my mind always kept telling me, if I could find her, it would be all right. Just find her. And my head knew what she looked like. It kept telling me. My head kept saying, one of these days you're going to round the corner and you're going to see her. She'll be standing there. And she'll be tall and blonde. And she'll be leaning against the fender of her white silver cloud Rolls Royce. <laughs> She will take one look at you and say, you're it. <laughs> you're the one I have been looking for all my life. One day I was talking to a friend of mine a while back and I said, you know what? This was a few months ago. I said, I'm finally starting to believe that the she that I have looked for all of my life with this great desperation is God. Okay? <laughs> You see, because I'm weak and I'm inadequate and I'm frightened and I'm chicken shit and I'm scared to death and all I ever wanted was for somebody to take care of me. Okay? So I decided I'm not going to look for her anymore. I will decide that she is God. And that is it. Now in my life, I have a lady who is not that tall, brunette, and drives a Dotson. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been more in love or happier. I've never had more communication with another human being. I've been married four times sober, which says, you know, I've been trying. God <laughs> I come to a convention now like this and I feel like I belong. Okay, you might say, well, of course you belong. You're an addict and alcoholic. Bullshit. I came in alcoholic anonymous meetings for nine years before I sat down and went and got comfortable. Before I felt like I belong, you see. So I believe that if, if anything at all I've got to share, if there's any message at all I have that's based on my experience, which is I can't fix me, that there is a God who loves me enough, who is powerful enough, who cares about me enough, that he gave me you, right? I mean, a slipper, drunk, took me to me. You can't intellectualize that one, you see? And 17 years sober, thank God for you and for God. See, because everything I have in my life today, I never even fantasized in my wildest imagination. I was never a worthy enough human being to live the way I live, to have the job I have, to earn the money I earn, to share the love that I share with my lady. I never was a worthy enough human being. So I guess God doesn't require anything from me other than just sit down, shut up, and let him bring me here to you, and you will lead me to what I have. And I really love you, and God bless you, and thank you very much. Thank you.